Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to the briefing room. My name is Eric Kavanaugh and I will be your host and I'm always also doing double duty today, folks. I'll also be your analyst for the show, which as you know is designed to reveal the essential characteristics of enterprise technologies. And we're going to cover some really, really interesting stuff today, folks, let me tell you. So there is a slide about yours truly and enough about me. So as many of you know, now the mission here at the briefing room is to dig into the software world and understand what are these technologies, how do they work, when should you use them, when should you not use them, how should you use them together, for example. And we're going to be talking today about a really fascinating concept. The title is Agile Data Rationalization for Operational Intelligence. And by operational intelligence, of course, we're referring to knowing what's going on in your organization right now, being able to see what's happening in your operations across many different systems, heterogeneous systems. We'll talk all about that heterogeneity and what a challenge it poses and has traditionally. So uh, let's see, you see some upcoming topics here. Jeffrey Malofsky is going to be our guest today. He is an actual data scientist, as I call him. He's a scientist first and then got into the whole data world after that and has a quite remarkable pedigree. He really is one of the most experienced and savvy professionals that I've met in the, all my years of doing this fun stuff. So hopefully that's saying something. And he's going to be talking about the tool that they have, but really also the methodology for dealing with things like master data management or data governance. So he'll talk for about 20, 25 minutes, then I'm going to make a few comments, talk about a few things, and then we'll get into the briefing proper. So with that, Jeffrey, I'm going to queue up your slides, hand it over to you, and just click on that slide and use the down arrow and take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much, and I'm very happy to be here talking with Eric. It's always a joy to be working with Eric. And so the topic for today, as Eric just mentioned, is how we do agile data rationalization for operational intelligence. And operational intelligence is one example of an area, what we will call a higher level application area, that absolutely relies on data rationalization, good data. So let's introduce the topic a little bit. Operational intelligence <clears throat> is a field that uses real-time data collected from the operating environment, uh, whatever it is, we are talking about IT right now, and that information in real time feeds a variety of analytic algorithms that are trying to detect problems and possibly predict problems and opportunities to gain efficiency. Because it's relying on these analytic algorithms, it completely uh, is vulnerable to and dependent upon the accuracy of the data and the completeness of the data. And those are two completely different things. So the accuracy of the data means how true it is, whether or not it's right or wrong, uh, whether it can be uh, traced and audited to an observable, quantitative, objective metric. And completeness means do you have enough data of enough different types so that your algorithm can do a good job of producing an output that is meaningful and trustworthy. We want to segue just for a second into the notion of big data. We were chatting about that on the intro. Uh, it's kind of one of the major topics that comes up frequently right now. And you can consider that operational intelligence is a natural use case for big data. Because if you want to detect problems in your environment, you obviously want to have your operational intelligence environment have tentacles out as far and wide as they can, even getting down to individual sensors that might be within your environment, uh, the flow of information. If you're looking in including security in there, you want information coming in and out of routers, et cetera. Uh, but there's really two types of big data. There's the type which is really most frequently talked about. Uh, we were just talking, if anybody you were on the pre-call, the Wall Street Journal ran a review of a new book titled Big Data for Something, 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 and there's been a lot of uh, talk about that. And so in that, they're talking about the use of big data for statistical analysis. And this is not a new, new use. This is market intelligence, market analysis. Uh, and what's critical to understand about that use case is in that use case, because you're talking about statistical analysis, 
quality is not that critical. And that was actually one of the major premises of this book that the Wall Street Journal article uh, reviewed, and I don't remember the author or the title that much. And uh, okay, so that's fine. An example of that is what Google and Yahoo and the big websites do every millisecond. They're not looking to know that any individual person sitting in an individual house on a specific street in a specific town is buying stuff at Walmart and not buying stuff at Target. They care about the ensemble uh, type of results, how things are moving in a direction. And then that's what they try to pick out, and then that's what they respond to. However, there's a completely different use case, which is an age-old one, which is using lots of data for deterministic analysis. And that means I really do want to know <clears throat> what that specific person in that specific house on that specific street is doing. Their quality is absolutely critical. And <clears throat> ironically, high volume is a limiting factor. Why is high volume limiting? Because you're trying to do this in real time. You're trying to actually sort through all this information in real time, and that puts a limiting case on your computing power, that's the CPU, on your storage power, and also on the actual power that you're using for the environment. Now, this shows up. Uh, everyone's probably assuming we're talking about large fixed infrastructures with lots of power, lots of HVAC, lots of computers, lots of servers. But this also comes out in mobile computing. But the other part of this is operational intelligence has a pedigree which comes out of military command and control, which has always used operational intelligence going back to the World War II time frame to try to do these very same things. And it's also been deployed in mobile type of environments where the limiting factor is how much information you can push through every second and how much actual power is consumed in trying to process that. Now, this may not seem important if you're a large manufacturing organization or you're, you're the Boeing plant producing the 787 Dreamliner or you're Google's data center, but in fact, there have been myriad stories about how Google has spent a lot of effort worrying about the amount of electricity being used in their data centers. As we move off to these uh, data centers from Amazon or Google or whomever, these become huge users of electricity, uh, water, a lot of other environmental concerns. So large scale, you have to pay the price somewhere. But the bigger issue here for the, uh, what the topic is that we're getting into, data rationalization, is the issue of deterministic analysis. If you want the right information and you want the right result, data quality is not only not passe, it is now even more critically important. And that comes down to the very last uh, topic there, which is still true. Garbage in equals garbage out. In the world of big data, you put big garbage in and you get galaxy class misinformation. Folks, this is not a career maker. If you go off and implement big data in your environment and you give reports and business intelligence to your CEO and CFO to make business strategy decisions and you're more wrong than you used to be, that's not something that makes everybody happy. So that's the world that we're dealing with. So <clears throat> enabling data success. So what we did is we spent quite a bit of time uh, diving into what were the real issues that prevented whether small, medium, large, humongous data that were preventing really these data environments from being accurate and efficient? And I would think that you could easily make the claim that most data environments are not that efficient uh, nowadays, and we can actually talk a little bit about quantifying that. But what we did was reverse engineer what were the major hurdles to getting to a highly efficient, highly accurate, meaningful, rationalized environment. And there's four major topics there that go along. I'll let everybody read those, and they should be somewhat self-explanatory. But the bigger issue that we focus on is, okay, now that we know those, what can we do about those, and what can we do about those very quickly? How can we go into a real environment with real people, 
with real programs, real budgets, and existing systems and not change everything, but basically drop in a catalytic converter to rapidly turn that all into a highly efficient, accurate, meaningful environment. So it boils down to you have to deal with the rapidity and accuracy of building data portfolio models that provide complete visibility across the data life cycle. So what does that mean? That means that the days when you could do everything siloed, that you have a completely different group of people who do architecture and strategy and requirements, another completely different group of people who do data modeling and information modeling and theory, and another group of people who do the data warehousing and data engineering, yet another group of people who go do data integration and another ETL, and believe it or not, yet another group of people who go do business intelligence and reporting and analytics. And if you expect them all to be speaking the same language, using the exact same data values, and to accurately and meaningfully produce a report and have efficiency through that, well, that's not going to happen in today's world. It's too complicated, it's too chaotic, and you need something more visible and more agile. So what we have done with our methodology and then the tools which enable our methodology, because there were really no coordinating tools that could satisfy this in an agile fashion, so we developed our own, is we're filling the gap in understanding and identifying practical ways to bring the operational data aligned with business and keep it all cycling through in a very rapid, visible way. One of the major issues in doing that is shown down at the second to last bullet is that there is a huge difference between the what is supposed to be similar and what is really similar uh, type of information. A lot of times where these projects get boiled down is, and get bogged down is because they're dealing with metadata only. And the reality is that the metadata is woefully out of synchronization with the actual real values that are going back and forth in your applications and your reports. That means that if you come up with standards and you get all these people together and you build standards and you build new data models and you build new services architecture all based upon metadata, what do you think is going to happen when you go try to merge the real data and then you try to put it into real ETL and real BI? I won't answer the question. I'll simply ask you to take a walk to your own corporate IT department and see what's going on, and that should be answer enough. So now, changing the slide, it gets down to here are the there's two types of rationalization. There's a design side rationalization and the system side rationalization. And down below is a simple uh, diagram of a very simple part of what a corporate environment might look like. The point is, it's not the Big Bang Theory. It's not as if there's three data marts and they all go to one ETL and then it's well-defined engineering and business requirements means that that's handled one time every night at 3 a.m. and then it goes on down the line. It's a huge mishmash of different technologies, opaque ETL, different values, uh, ID numbers that sometimes have a suffix, sometimes don't have a suffix, sometimes have a prefix, used for all these different things. And so you have all these different rationalization challenges. You have multiple data models. You have definitions that, if they're known, conflict with each other. And again, I want to keep hitting that just because a table or an element, a column in a data model looks like they have the same name is in no way indicative that the operating values that are sitting in those data marts and warehouses and uh, transactional stores are really targeted to the same use cases today. And the business logic which would answer that is mostly not available. All that feeds to the ETL problem, and then uh, you generally don't even recognize that the ETL is as equally as hard as everything else you've done upstream. In fact, we've looked at a lot of real-world ETL, and because it's so unknown how to merge that data, the bulk of the ETL is just direct mapping. Hey, move it from point A to point B, and I'll figure it out later. But then that's only half the story. The other half of the story is the data rationalization, the system rationalization side, where you have multiple system types, uh, conflicting formats, 
unsynchronized value, integration points, and there's a real performance problem. One of the other things that we would like to say is that the days when you need to throw expensive hardware capacity at your data environment should be over. It is not over, but what you're doing when you continue to buy these very expensive servers, you're basically paying a lot of money for the inherent inefficiency of your data structures, your database servers, your data integration tools, everything which was built for yesteryear. All those things were built for the design constraints of yesteryear. And so you're throwing a lot of money for a minimal amount of improvement in capacity. So that's not tenable. That opens the door to cloud computing and outsourcing and the plug Eric, he has Amazon coming in on, in a couple weeks. That's one example of that. But we solve that problem agilely in your existing environment as an alternative approach. As an example, I want to point out, uh, I, first let's take a look at the bottom here. Because since people were, are so used to dealing with metadata, sometimes people forget that there's real data values underneath the metadata. So this is an example, this is a real example. I use this very frequently because it's an open source real world example based upon residential real estate listings. So it's kind of obvious what's going on. And we look at this, it's you know real systems, real data. And the three columns that are highlighted are all supposed to be about the same thing. They're all supposed to be about the number of garage spaces in the house. So you quickly look at the left one and you see, well, that's not very consistent. There's a lot of text there. There's some numbers. What do I do with that? Ah, but on the right hand too, that's easy to merge. I can do all the standardization and all the ETL and all the BI because uh, they're both integers. No, that's even the harder problem because the traceability to the business logic by a two in Texas may or may not be equivalent to a three in home seekers. That's critical for regulatory uh, requirements. That's critical if you want to have a nation US wide listing and be able to do searches on garage spaces. That's the exact information which is not forthcoming from enterprise architecture and business process modeling and all that kind of stuff. So our approach does not force you to take the big top down or weeds up type of approach. It's trying to be very realistic and very respectful of your time. We basically try to say, hey, if you adopt our approach, we're going to give you back hours of your day, hours of your week. We're going to let you go to the golf club and be successful and get promoted. So some of the observations that have come across for the, uh, the years are listed at the top uh, in bullet form. And notice that what actually rules your environment are the values sitting in your databases and warehouses. It's not the metadata. You can do all the metadata analysis that you want, and metadata analysis is great. It is a wonderful thing. But unless you are absolutely sure that the metadata accurately reflects your current data value set, then it's just kind of misinformation. We close that gap. We actually do make sure the metadata accurately reflects operational values. Next, that we recognize that the data values conflict across stores and groups and applications. And there's two types of that. There's the syntactic kind, which is the format. And that's the kind that you often hear about when people are doing metadata management or data integration or data quality reviews. And that's really the most trivial, simple case. Because, okay, so it's a date field in one and it's a string field in the other. You know what? In today's world, I don't really care. Can, storage is cheap. I don't need to worry about whether it's two bytes or four bytes or eight bytes. I can throw six bytes at it and not worry. I can throw the computational cycles of the CPU at it and do the conversion and not worry. So I don't need that. Those were made for 20 years ago when every megabyte on a hard disk was incredibly expensive. The much more difficult problem is the one we're showing down below. That's the one we're addressing agilely. So our methodology is based upon this rationalization and portfolio management. They go hand in hand. There's two sides of the same coin. And it's really based upon, as talked about on the left, is a 
fully easily integrated view across organization process technology, simple synchronization and continuous synchronization between metadata and the operational data, and one of the key issues in our approaches is recognizing that just because you have, let's say, five versions of customer name doesn't mean that four of them are wrong. You may have two or three completely valid business use cases, but they're just not understood. They're not documented. They're not managed. So what we do is in tens of minutes quickly identify the stakeholders' scopes, the activities, the systems, the use cases of those, and then if they can be distilled into one perfect one, that's fabulous. But if they can't, no big deal, because what we'll do is accept all of the valid ones, but we will differentiate them both at the business model layer and directly into the execution layer. There a live data, the live ETL, the live BI, and there's a direct visible line continuously forever. Doing this, agility, means that we're reducing the cycle time from months, years, down to days and weeks. And then what you see here is our process. You see it's kind of a simple process collect and observe, analyze and orient, decide and, and design, and build and act. And critically, up at the collect and observe, we're doing all source collection. That's part of the secret sauce. You can't just wait for people to give you structured information that's perfect, so we'll take anything of any kind. We're the garbage dump of architecture and modeling. Now, for some of you, because we're talking about operational intelligence, if you look at the second word in each one of the bubbles, starting at the top, observe, orient, decide, act, and you put them together as an acronym, <clears throat> they come up with what's known as the OODA loop. That is an age-old uh, design for war fighting, real-time war fighting, and it controls how people, when they're doing life-threatening, mission-critical things in real time go about doing their business, and it also means it's how you deal with your adversary. Why is this important for operational intelligence? Because operational intelligence is one part of that, is what's happening inside of your safe environment. The other part of that, unfortunately in today's world, is has somebody inserted themselves in your environment, and are they doing something destructive or stealing from you, and you have to figure that out as well. So in the OODA loop, there's lots of theory about it, is that you get inside your adversary's OODA loop and you can completely disrupt their business. So from an operational intelligence point of view, you want to detect those situations as well. Now a big part of our technology approach is what we call the SciCore system model. This is a predefined model of intuitive industry standard concepts already pre-related. And what this does is eliminate 100% <clears throat> the need for you to go in and do that blank sheet of paper approach of like, what do we do? Why do we do it? What do you want to call it? I don't want to call it the same thing, so let's fight about that for three days. No, you simply create instance lists of each of those. In practice, we actually build an entire architecture of products, of business models, of data models, of XML schema, of rules, of codes, one week prior to even engaging with the client. And then we walk in with this, so all you have to do is by exception. You'll also notice that the relationships are predefined, and so the reason we had to build our own tool is that we collate from other tools and your people data models, XML schema, code dictionaries, uh, whatever you have, so that you can build these relationships with simple point and click, and therefore everybody in your organization, no matter what part of the life cycle they work on, are always seeing the same thing. It's authoritative, because whoever owns the data model will see it and know it's the right one. Whoever owns the business activity model will see it and say it's the right one. And forever, it's always the right thing and easily kept up to date. That gets us down to actually the solution capability. So this is what a, data, a rationalized data environment should have. On the design side, you have consolidated adaptive data models. Adaptive is important because your business world is changing all the time. 
You can't afford 12 months to rebuild your data models every time something happens, like the CEO just bought another institution, and you now have to consolidate those systems. So you have to do these things in days and weeks. The standards, it's very common for people either to give up creating the standards or they create such abstract standards to get agreement, a customer is somebody who buys from me. Well, what does that do with the six different CRM systems where the data is all complete? So we, that's what you're looking for. And then on the system side, you want commonality, you want efficiency, you want continuously synchronized interfaces. And the way we do that is our methodology coupled with the two supporting tools that we provide, which are Datastar Discovery and Datastar Unifier. And as we mentioned, a centralized repository is critical to both of those. And then the last slide I'm going to concentrate on is another key part of our technology. We call it the last mile part. It's a next generation approach to doing the data modeling called corporate NoSQL, which is a marriage of the new NoSQL field with traditional data modeling constructs. Everybody understands it very, very quickly. You see tables. The difference is inside the tables, you don't spend a lot of time coming up with the perfect list of columns. Why? Because there is no such thing as a perfect list of columns, because things change. A data model is not a piece of art to stand on its own legs. It is merely a, a mechanism by which you marry the business need for putting data in and getting reports and applications out to the construct and management of the data. And if it has to change day to day, then change it day to day. That's not what's important. What's important is that it's efficient. So how do you do that when you don't have all that business logic, when you don't know all the answers? That's what corporate NoSQL does. It uses the NoSQL approach of what we call a type value pair, and every single thing that you would normally consider a structured data column, data entity, data concept, becomes a vocabulary member which is mapped into the type element at runtime, and you can change it at any time. It's not buried physically into the data model or the database server. It is something which is logically mapped to it at runtime. So you can change it at any moment in time. You can change it in a governance meeting and then implement it in your production cycle that same day. That's reducing the cycle time. Secondly, there's direct visibility <clears throat> from the business side all the way down to the executable data through the business intelligence and reporting. And that's because, as opposed to older approaches to data modeling, it really is, doesn't matter what the title of these tables are. They can be whatever your, your CEO can design this. In fact, what you're looking at was designed in real time with non-technical governance people saying, these are the major issues which are important to us. We said, got it, no problem, let's build some tables. That's what we'll call it. You think identifier is important, we're going to call it identifier. And then all the vocabulary was one half designed by those people, the other half taken out of the real data environment through reverse engineering and all the policies. And to show you the simplicity of how it actually sits in any database server of your desire is this little picture down here on the lower right-hand side. So when applied to an environment, this not only gives you the capability of rationalized data, but it gives you the organizational benefits of going into whatever you have right now and delivering the benefits quickly, easily, and with uh, a catalytic capability. So at that, I'll stop, Eric. Okay, good. Well, folks, let me go ahead and jump to some other slides here. I wanted to throw some thoughts at you all and just kind of see where would this uh, conversation goes. But this is obviously very interesting stuff, and it's game-changing stuff. So. Let me put up a slide from a webcast we did a couple years ago now. This was designed by my partner, Dr. Robin Bloor, the Information-Oriented Architecture. We were just trying to get a look at all the different kinds of systems that you have in the enterprise. So there are data management systems, there's middleware, you can see there are BI applications, uh, there are source systems, there's software development, you have the cloud way up there in the top right-hand corner there. And the idea that we're trying to demonstrate here is the inherent complexity of enterprise systems and environments. And to Jeffrey's point, one of the key considerations to take into mind here and to take to heart 
is that so many of the efforts to build things like data warehouses and create analytical solutions used techniques to, for example, normalize the data. So you extract data from your ERP system, for example, and then you load it into a data warehouse. Well, when you extract the data from those systems, you're losing, so, oh, actually I have to take back the, in order to show the slide. Thank you, one of our folks pointed that out. So when you take data out of these systems, you're losing a lot of the context. And we did that because you had to do it, because it was just too expensive to extract and transform and load all of the data. I mean, you just couldn't do that. Storage was expensive, ETL is expensive, the resources are expensive. So pulling all that data out, we focused on the values and then aggregated them in things like OLAP cubes and, and used other mechanisms to get as clear a view as we could possibly get. Well, if you start to think about how heterogeneous the environment is right now, and we'll talk about some of the other changes that are taking place, there are so many applications out there. There are so many legacy business applications that were run, they were built for Windows, for example, or for Linux. There are all these Java-based applications these days. Some of the legacy systems out there are still running COBOL. There's a whole universe of applications out there. And in fact, uh, the uh, database guru over at Pervasive Software had a quote a few weeks ago that I will never forget. He said something like, okay, so elephants go to a special place to die, but there is no software graveyard. All software just goes to the cloud, <laughs> right? So he's saying that once you write software programs and people start using them, they're probably not going to go away. They're going to stick around for a long time. So what do we do? Now if you think about what has happened with mobile and all these different mobile apps out there and all the different things happening, all the different systems and all the different languages even. You've got competitors, big companies like Google and Yahoo and Facebook and AOL, and these guys are all competing, and we all know what that usually means. They'll more or less agree to certain standards, but in reality, what do you get? And I start asking myself, are we right now in the data tower of Babel? So for those of you who don't know the story, I'm going to throw a fairly controversial thought at you. Uh, this is from Wikipedia. So if you just replace God with innovation and read what this says, innovation came down to see what the people had did, all those wonderful uh, vendors and so forth. They are one people and they have one language and nothing will be withheld from them, which they purpose to do. Come, let us go down and confound their speech. And so innovation scattered them upon the face of the earth and confused their languages like SQL and NoSQL and Java and JavaScript and C Sharp and C++ and C++ and COBOL and machine language so that they would not be able to return to each other and they left off building the city which was called Babel because innovation there confounded the language of all the earth. I mean that is kind of a strange way to look at this but seriously let's think about this for a second. So now let me take a bit of a left turn and let's think about data and moving data and create a metaphor to moving people around, right? Because it used to be very difficult for people to get around. So back in the days of the Tower of Babel, what did you do? Well, you used a horse if you had some money, right? And that could get you across country in a matter of weeks, perhaps. Then many, many years later, we developed trains. And you know, once you have trains, who's going to ride around on horses from town to town or state to state? Not too many people. Move forward a bit longer, and of course, we have much nicer forms of transportation that can get us across large distances very quickly. And then, of course, you have other innovations like this beautiful aircraft here. And, well, if you can fly across the country to a meeting, you're certainly not going to walk across the country or ride a horse across the country. That would be insane. You wouldn't think of doing something like that unless you were going on some kind of a journey to, to backpack across the nation. So let's look at the new reality of what's happening out there. And this is just in the last few years. I think it's very interesting what's what's happening folks. So open source innovations are opening up a whole new way of capturing, storing, and processing data. Some of these solutions, of course, the open source ones, are free. Now granted, it's not completely free because you have to hire usually Java developers to deal with the stuff to piece it all together. But when you compare that to paying some top tier vendor a million bucks for a database and then another $150,000 every year that you want to keep using it, unless you want the lawyers to come and start wrangling your, your cash flow, well, it's suddenly a compelling story. 
So the storage game, and Jeffrey talked about this, the storage game has changed dramatically. With Hadoop, you can now store massive amounts of granular detail. So remember, we talked about stripping out all that granularity to fit it through those tiny pipes to get it into the database that was expensive to manage and then get it back out again sometime later. Well, that's changing. I mean, that is just significantly different today than it was even five years ago. And then we talk about big data. Well, 10 years ago, big data, we didn't really talk about it because we didn't really have the technologies and the tools and the methods for dealing with it. Well, all that is changing too. So the new reality number two, no SQL database technologies are game changing for a variety of reasons, one of which is because of the speed. Some of these vendors, Datastax in particular, talks about, and they sit on top of Cassandra, they talk about a million writes to the database per second, per second. Now granted, that's in a very structured type of format. It's a very specific kind of structure. So we're not talking about writing a million records with all kinds of details to it. It's a different story, but just think about it for a second. We are in a continuum in terms of technology and innovation and uses. So what's going to happen? Think about the amount of groundswell that exists in the open source movement. Look at all the projects out there. Most of the interesting stuff we're seeing these days comes from the open source community, or at least sits on top of open source projects. So we also have massive parallel processing, of course, which has changed the game, multi-core processors in memory. Lots of things are changing. And I want to throw one last interesting example. Um, so the cost of software is in precipitous decline. So let me just give you one example. In 2005, when I worked at the Data Warehousing Institute, <laughs> we were using uh, on 24 is the WebEx platform, but on 24 did not support a live demo. And so we had to go out and find another solution that did, and Microsoft Live Meeting did support a live demo. So this is late 2005. <laughs> they quoted me $7,500 to host a one-hour webcast. That's just to provide the technology to actually show slides and take questions and have phone lines and so forth. Now they, I negotiated down to all of $2,500. We paid 2,500 bucks to use that one time. In 2007, many of the vendors had gotten down to more like $1,500 per webcast or $1,000 per webcast. Today, and in fact back in 2011, here at the Bloor Group, we pay less than $500 a month for unlimited webcasts, unlimited. So you go from being quoted $7,500 for one to getting $500 for as many as you want. Well, that, of course, is not panning out exactly in all the different areas of enterprise technology, but it is panning out. I mean, this is coming true all around us, folks, and we'll see what's going to happen. So let me start throwing some questions over to you, Jeffrey. And I'll actually throw up some of your slides probably because they're prettier than mine. Uh, but let's just kind of dig into some of these questions. And folks, of course, you know we're looking for you to send in some good questions as well. So first of all, NoSQL, you talked about corporate NoSQL. W what is the engine that you're using? In the, uh, so we have two separate tools, Data Store Discovery, which does the data rationalization design and management and also the data portfolio management think of true for data, actual operational data, that is uh, for performance reasons and simplicity and also uh, back-end security, uh, that is the completely homegrown back-end. In fact, it's a very simple architecture. All the content objects, of which there's six or seven, are stored in XML files, and the data is transferred in JSON format uh, across the three tiers. It's a three-tier architecture. Data Store Unifier, which automatically uses the products like uh, data models and code dictionaries, et cetera, from the discovery repository, and actually does an agile way to map the business need via a data object into the data integration code, then that actually is uses the same type of infrastructure for the design side. You have to stay there. But for the implementation side, it has two uh, components down at the bottom where it says data unifier. Uh, we have a virtualization engine that uses a homegrown integration engine and fast transactional engine for that reason, and that is all file based and JSON based. And then, in order to support uh, existing corporate IT environments, we will then output the runtime ETL 
to your favorite in-house ETL engine, uh, Informatica, Adminitio, Microsoft, you know, whatever it would talent, whatever it would be, and we can actually automatically read from those repositories. So what we also do is we read the ETL and marry it to the rest of your business model so you can actually see how the ETL is being used vis-a-vis -vis the rest of your environment. We even allow you to automatically reverse engineer and extract a full-blown data model from the ETL so that when you do the import, that's one of the options. So that NoSQL engine for the design and management side is home built. For the vir transactional virtualization engine, it is also home built because it's pretty simple to do. And then otherwise, to support existing corporate environments, we will simply feed existing ETL tools and database servers. Now, one of the issues about that is our corporate NoSQL structure, if you want to just go to the last slide, Eric, is consciously been designed to be so simple that what you're seeing was actually put into an existing Oracle server. And like many NoSQL structures, the same data on the same Oracle server on the same piece of hardware operated with the same calls for data 10,000 times faster. And that's owed to it, uh, like all NoSQL, being a fully indexed simple infrastructure here. So at a very technical level, one of the benefits of NoSQL is you just say goodbye database joins. I don't need to spend $200,000 on a piece of hardware because my database server is so inefficient. Uh, I would also suggest that that is something that is should be of value uh, to corporations as they're looking to rationalize their environment. Yeah, that is really that's really interesting stuff. So I've got some history with master data management, and of course this whole industry of, or discipline of MDM grew out of the fact that people realized, it seems to me, that data warehousing was not going to solve all the needs. So if you think about why data warehousing came into being, it's because you really couldn't query operational systems or enterprise resource planning systems. You, you didn't want to disrupt those systems, and so instead what you would do is pull all the data, as we discussed, into your data warehouse, well, then we figured out, guess what, that's actually difficult, too, because there are all these other systems we want to get involved, and, and you have these different definitions across different applications and, and uh, even different organizations. And so master data management comes along as a way to virtually reconcile those systems, but it's still rather downstream, I guess is how I would put it, whereas what you're talking about is looking to accomplish the same end goal of master data management, but doing it further upstream. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, and exactly. And so uh, the master data management mo world uh, moved into this. Unfortunately, you find a lot of people out there in the data universe, uh, everybody rediscovering the same hard lessons learned painfully one step at a time. Like, um, I think it's, you know, a lot of this could be solved if in, instead, when people go to conferences, instead of them going to the fixed talks, if we just went all went to the bar at 8 a.m. and stayed until midnight, I guarantee you we'd fix all these problems, or at least, <laughs> at least agree amongst ourselves that we have. But the master data management, think of the first adjective, master. You can't master something unless you know everything about it, can manage it, understand it, analyze it, distill it. Everything which goes into master data management is the stuff that nobody knows. So people jumped into master data management going, hey, we can't consolidate or merge our data, so I know, let's create an MDM hub. And so somehow they were surprised when the data that went into the hub wasn't that accurate or common. So you have to get ahead of the game. We purposefully keep our uh, approach to the technology very simple because we don't want to prejudge. People have investments already. We're not here coming in saying, hey, throw away what you've done. If you bought an MDM hub, basically the output of what we do can go immediately into that MDM hub. So you can actually place what we're talking about anywhere in your environment, anywhere in your organizational processes and groups. It can be go into the IT group, it can go into the business group, it can go into both. Uh, and we purposefully did that because we want to make sure that we are truly agile. You know, so you know, I go to the gym all the time and I play basketball, and in my mind I'm doing all these things LeBron James does, 
thankfully nobody's <laughs> taking video of me, so I can go home with that uh, view of the world. But we have, at least in this technology point of view, tried to be that agile so we can adapt to whatever your real environment is. Gotcha. And let's talk about, because a lot of this stuff is very big picture, but you also mentioned that, and of course this works much better, I think, in the enterprise when you go and try to sell something. Can you give an example of what maybe a small engagement might look like? What would be a small problem to tackle or some low-hanging fruit for someone who might think this sounds interesting? So we're actually doing that with people. We're actually offering up kind of an, an assessment. So we'll come into your environment. You know, we're focused on the data conflicts. Uh, you can't get common data. You can't produce a report. You don't know what to do. You want to build a new warehouse. You your data models conflict. And we'll do a simple 30-day assessment of, a, of a, an important actual real-world business scope. And in that 30 days, we will take whatever you have of any source, we will produce the complete end-to-end -end view of what's really going on in your environment, what's really going on in the architecture, how things are related to each other, and we'll produce the as-is state, which will be data models and code dictionaries and rule dictionaries and any XML schema, and we will actually specify implementable st uh, strategies for the rationalizing the data and for a subset of key business data concepts between 1 and 10, that determines the price of the engagement, we will actually fully represent the solution space such that you can implement it in your real operational environment. And that goes all the way end to end from the policy the CEO just issued to the actual ETL, the warehouse, and the BI report coming out of the other end. And that price can be uh, low for a small organization that has, you know, a small amount of data, not too distributed, or obviously depending upon the scope, if you're a very large Fortune 100 company, then it'll grow up just because of the complexity of the environment. Yeah, right. Okay, good. Let me throw this uh, slide up here as well. This is your the core's system model. Um, so if you could just kind of walk through this just another quick second, like maybe let's pick one particular piece and then work out from there. So in the middle you've got processes, left organizations, right technologies, functions under processes, what, and then you've got these different objectives, mechanisms. Can you talk about what you mean by functions in this context? Yeah, everything here has, I'm glad you brought that up. In our real system, you can pull this up at any time, and if you mouse over, you get the definition. As always, Eric, you, you honed in on a very important point, and somebody just asked about ontologies. This is actually an ontology. We don't say it very much because people in the data world really aren't comfortable with ontologies, but this actually grew out of a project we had in a full-blown semantic world called knowledge discovery and dissemination. The point was, even in the pure ontology view, people waste so much time basically coming up for our synonyms, which have been done innumerable times before. So we <laughs> went through a bunch of standards and peer-reviewed literature, and the definition of these things are all predefined. A function is just a, a business activity. It's no more complicated than that. And then every one of those definitions is well known. And the idea is that anybody in your organization, from the least technical business person to the most highly technical person, they all have a shared understanding in the first six seconds that they see this model. So you don't have any crosstalk. You go, oh, function. Well, if you said that on a uh, SOAR chart, I would have thought you meant the function of my system. But since it's a child to process and it's defined as a business activity, it's whatever the specific activities are to support a process. What are the processes? They really should be the main lines of business that are on your website. It's whatever your, your organization exists to do. And so you just flow down from that, and so it becomes a very rapid way of doing it. In fact, in a typical engagement, because a lot of people have this information in unstructured information, we, in our professional services, we have a library of routines that we ex automatically extract and correlate the information from Word documents, PDF, uh, some Visio documents, you know, Excel spreadsheets. So you're not just getting it pulled out, but we actually correlate everything and produce this entire picture. Yeah, that's impressive. And one of the attendees is asking, 
what are the sizes of organizations you've worked with in the past. And, of course, this methodology has been around for some time, and then you built some tools to facilitate. Maybe you could talk about some of the bigger engagements you've had around the methodology or maybe the, the, the actual technology as well. Yeah, we probably did. I, still, I mean, if anybody's on, and I, and I hope they are, is that I have an open bet of uh, state dinner and scotch. If you can find worse data with more organizational conflicts than the United States Navy's human resources environment, hey, it's on me, your entire family, kids, grandkids, everybody. <laughs> Don't get everybody. Because that's where we grew this technology. It's probably the hardest environment because there's probably uh, ten major groups. None of them will talk to each other. Every single get-together is he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong, I'm right, trust me. And the data itself goes back six or seven decades. It has different codes over that period of time. It has different values over that period of time. And the, the, what is supposed to be exactly the same data in different groups wildly conflicts with each other. There had been 15 years of about $200 million of hiring the best and brightest to solve that problem. They all failed. This is where we grew out of, and we completely solved it. In fact, the uh, three-star admiral who was in charge of it liked it so much, he left the Navy, and he's now our COO. <laughs> so, and then all that can be done in, a, in that problem, which people have been working on for 20 years, we can completely solve end-to-end -end in three months. And they go, no way. And the answer is, yes way. And the reason is, is because we are avoiding all the bottlenecks. And those bottlenecks, you can't throw enough money at the problem. And so there are certain problems in engineering you can't solve with bodies and money. You just have to think through them. That's what we've done, and this sci -Cores model is a major piece of that answer. Okay, good. And we've got a few other good questions from the audience here. I know you already texted some of these to folks, but for, uh, for the purpose of the audience, I'll throw one over to you. So one of the attendees writes, okay, so th does this approach – or tool reconcile differences in the metadata with the operational data sources and then how are rules maintained? Right, and I answered that in writing, and the answer is that's definitely, that's exactly what we're doing. And so we uh, reconcile it because in Data Star Discovery, we collect all the metadata, but we also have a module called the Investigator Module where we reach into the live database server, automatically extract all the unique values for each individual element and then allow you to then point and click and view those relative to this system model. This is called the system model, but also relative to other elements, other tables, not only within that, that one data model, but across multiple data models, and then relate them back out to glossaries and code dictionaries and rule dictionaries. And then in terms of where those rules get stored, it's consciously very flexible so that it makes sense where it makes sense to you. You can actually build a full-blown rule dictionary, which, we, which is free text, business-like rules. We're trying to capture the corporate knowledge of your business side, and then you can reference those. You can actually store rules on every single element and table in every single data model, and you can also write rules or reference a rule dictionary on all the entities you're looking at in the Cycores model and the system model. And all that stuff can be cross-referenced. So we're trying to make it make sense. If we, people took our advice, and, I, and I'm, I consciously know that that doesn't happen all the time. I've been married twice, so I've been disabused of that notion. But <laughs> if you uh, took our advice, we actually have put into Data Store Discovery the ability to treat a, quote, data model as the corporate knowledge center of everything upstream and downstream and all that is simply and visibly done. But you don't have to do it that way. We just think that that is a nice way to make it easy for the technical people and the business people to kind of come together. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it's, it, it, to me, it speaks to the fundamental shift that's taking place right now. And I think probably user adoption is going to be the hardest hurdle to, to overcome in the near future. But it, I think we have to remember that so many of the systems that are in use today, especially legacy systems, were written for 
old hardware and old operating systems and uh, old processes. And the bottlenecks that we talked about are just much different now than they were before. So it seems to me that what you guys have is one of a handful of tools that, and I would argue that probably SAP HANA is similar just in that it's such a complete rewrite from what they had been doing before. But it seems to me that what you're talking about and what you've put together here is emblematic of how significantly the entire application and information architecture can be redesigned now, right? Yeah, and, and uh, as you know, I'm a, a former scientist, so as a, form, a pure technical person, I think SAP's HANA is brilliant, an absolute stunning achievement of in-memory supercomputing. And so, I mean, I just laud them completely for doing so. As a uh, entrepreneur, startup businessman, we have kind of gone the other way, and a lot of that was based upon our experience, is that we have just found, and I'd love to hear SAP comment on this, that many large organizations know their environment is brittle. And the last thing they want to do is start pushing on that environment for fear that it will break and then jobs will be lost. You know, like the, the dinosaur, the dragon in the front office will awaken and kill somebody. So they kind of <laughs> just like want to like walk very gently around the server room and, and touch it. Our approach is that you can drop it into anything. It's not going to break anything. You can put it in parallel, which is good engineering design, and then turn it on a little bit at a time, kind of valve it in. And so we took it as a low-cost, easy, fast way to put it into a creaking environment. And basically, we're trying to have everybody look good, everybody get promoted with no risk of failure. <laughs> and let's, let's kind of go back to this, uh, the CORE's model again and, and the methodology. And one of the things I really liked in the first conversation we had some time ago is this process where you don't say no. So you were talking about the, the Navy issue and the human resources system. And of course, one of the big hurdles or bottlenecks, or it's even more than that, it's more like quicksand that dooms so many of these projects, especially MDM-style projects, is that people do not want to agree on the definition of entities, whether it be how to define customer or product or service or whatever the case may be. And so what you do is walk in and say to everybody in the room, all of your definitions are correct, right? Can you kind of talk about that and how that diffuses the situation? Yeah, exactly, because what happens is, is that, uh, and we're not being pejorative, but people have gotten so busy and the data environment has grown up in crisis mode or in busy mode over a large number of years that the business people come in and they do what business people are good at. They're thinking about, I have something I have to do business-wide, and I'm not that concerned whether it's called AB, AB underscore AB, or whatever. So, and what happens in, in, uh, commonly is a term will be used on a day-to-day -day basis and become jargon. That's not the way data modelers and ETL and technical people think. A term is defined, it has a definition, you're not sure what it is, go to the manual. So what happens is when you try to come in and do standardization or rationalization, what the business people are talking about, customer name, may have no relationship to what the technical guy is talking about. So we don't want to fight that battle. We want to solve that battle without having the argument. So the starting point is, hey, everybody's right. If you weren't right, it wouldn't be being used operationally. Any data that is being used operationally must be valuable because you're running a business. So what we're going to do is, however, it's not okay to have these things undocumented and unmanaged. So we're going to take this CORS model, and I'm going to ask you, business person, you said it was customer name, but when do you use it, why do you use it, and give me an example of when you don't use it. Boom, 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 we fill in the blanks. Somebody else in another group, what do you use it for? And what happens, all that occurs in uh, about two minutes, they realize, oh, I'm actually using customer name for collections, you're using it to send out brochures, and why they overlap, they really are slightly different use cases. So the next question is, can they be consolidated into one and the same? You have a little bit of conversation, and then the answer is most of the time, but not always. So what we would do is capture all that and then go, you know what, the answer to that is, let's create a common data element called customer name, and let's create another two, and we'll call one 
customer name dot accounting and customer name dot sales and those would be used for those special cases and now we know exactly the scope of which we're used so we can go into the existing database write some extremely simple ETL and we can now move the existing data and move it into the common entity or these other entities or both no big deal yeah that's really amazing it's just it's a way of dissolving the problem one of my favorite philosophers, I think it was Wittgenstein, once made a comment that you could argue is a bit of a smart alecky remark, but he says something like, the answer lies in the dissolution of the question. And I think that that's somewhat analogous to what you're doing here. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and so the key thing is to remember that, uh, and this is the problem with architecture, you know, I, I, I always say, you know, I was a consultant for a long time, so I produced thousand page reports of enterprise architecture, and it was a lot of fun and fruitful but it didn't really show up anywhere, is enterprise <laughs> architecture is an example of a top-down model that requires you to capture accurate, integrated corporate knowledge. What is it that nobody's been able to do for 20 years? Capture uh, accurate, integrated corporate knowledge. So your architecture is going to be as good as that integrated corporate knowledge, and there's your answer. The bottom-up approach, which is you throw – uh, something into the system or you throw an MDM hub in is only going to be as good as your capture point and then taking those captured results back to the uh, client and going, okay, well, I have all these stones. Which of the ones, which of these stones are the same and which ones are different? And they're going to go, I don't know. I thought your tools solved that. And so you're <laughs> left in the same place. So we want to go in and say, we'll solve the problem knowing that that's the real world situation. Yeah, that's great stuff. Well, folks, we've burned through an hour and change here. I know I could sit here and talk all day with Jeffrey. I think that these guys have done something really quite fascinating. So we will archive this webcast for later viewing. Feel free to go to insideanalysis.com anytime. Look under the webcasts section to check out the archives. And you can also get the slides from, uh, from the console here. And we'll also link to the slides from our website. But we've been talking with Jeffrey Malosky of Phasic Systems. And uh, I think they've done something which is really quite compelling and is just fundamentally changing what we're dealing with out there, folks. So with that, we're going to bid you farewell. Uh, presenters, stay online for a quick post-conference, but uh, we'll catch up to you next time, folks. Take care. Bye-bye.